American Black History Reader, 101 Questions You Never Thought to Ask by Dr. Claude Anderson. Chapter two, or part two. Question two, are black Americans an official social economic underclass? Whether well, black Americans are this nation's official underclass depends on the criteria used to define the term. In the broadest sense, an underclass is that segment of population that occupies the lowest possible position in a ranking order of social acceptability. The enactment of the nation's constitution in 1789 and the first nationalization law of 1790 established a rank order that placed whites at the top and entitled to all the society benefits and co-signed blacks to the bottom rank with no entitlements, not even to life itself. The nationalization law declared America to be a white nation with blacks acceptable only as slaves. In subsequent years of Jim Crow semi-slavery and political correctness, a deliberate and carefully interlinked set of laws and public policies assured black presence as a sub subordinated labor and consumer class. Consequently, black people became that the designated official underclass and it, and it has to be re repudiated or changed. Until that happens, blacks are restricted to conditions that place them outside beneath mainstream society. Governmental agency and scholars have broadened and modernized the definition of an underclass as any group in America that lives as if they were in a poverty stricken country this, limit, this immigration-based, politically correct public policy is designed to shift the nation's focus from blacks to Hispanics, Asians, and other um, uh, immigrating ethnicities. However, this gesture changes nothing in the original underclass designation. Because the immigrant groups have always ranked above blacks in the order of social and political acceptability, immigrant groups are credential by federal authorities and are granted access to benefits. As soon as the next government generation loses its essence, even those with some color are accepted as white and moved into middle class and upper classes. Black as the case have never had the class mobility granted to immigrants. The US census chart below, real median household income, race and Hispanic origin of households, 1967 to 2014 shows how blacks stay fixed in the underclass income status. It depicts the racial hierarchy in our society and presents the reality that blacks are fixed at the lowest income level. The census chart on page four shows that, a, that at the peak of the 1967 black civil rights movement, White median household income was 52,200, double the 26 and 800 median household of income of blacks. The charts also depicts the change of immigrants' immigration policies that, in response to the 1965 civil rights law, opened the doors for the immigrants based upon ethnicity and family ancestry. The newly arriving immigrants were classified as minorities and made eligible for benefits and opportunities that blacks had been historically denied. The massive influx of Hispanic immigrants began in 1970, and the U.S. Census chart indicates that at the outset, their incomes began at 38,900, well above the income of blacks in by 2014. Hispanics' income had reached 42,500 and 7,000 higher than blacks, even though 90% of all Hispanics in America 2014 had been in the country less than 45 years. Similarly, in the late 1980s, Asians who have been combined in a classification with Arabs began to enter the country. Their median household income was 64,000 and by, 2000, by 2014, their median was, income was 74,300, double that of black Americans. It is noteworthy that the U.S. Census chart indicates not only that all groups enter the higher incomes than blacks, but by 2014, the median household income for all groups was up while the income for native black Americans was headed downward. The downward trend for blacks further indicates that as a group, they are as nation official underclass. A report by the Urban Institute 
the color of wealth in the nation's capital. The subject of an article in the Washington Post on November 2nd, 2016. The grim statistics in this article on the black wealth reinforced census chart are further evidence that blacks as a group are the nation's official underclass. The Urban Institute report pointed out that in the District of Columbia region, that net worth of the white household was 81 times that of black households. Whites had the net worth of 248,000 and net worth of blacks was only 3,500. This disparity was even more stark because within the region, Prince George's County, Maryland, has also has the highest concentration of wealth educated blacks in America. Yet Hispanic immigrants in the DC region have acquired four times the net worth of blacks even though as a group 90% have been in America in the DC region barely 40 years. The same bottle wrong status applies to blacks in America ownership, wealth, the accumulation and in the hiring process. A group becomes the wealth accumulation and in the hiring process. A group becomes a permanent underclass when regardless of individual expectation that exist that exit. The group remains fixed at the lowest level century after century, regardless of whether the mainstream economy is experiencing boom or regardless of bus time. And an underclass that the black race and its members are routinely blamed for their own social economic dilemmas. Conservatives argue that blacks underclass status from failures to take advantage of the limited social and political economic opportunities that this nation offers to all groups. They further postulate that blacks are handicapped by their attitudes, values, cultures, and, and work ethics, which dif differ from that of mainstream white society. Blacks did not become a permanent underclass on their own. It is critically important that black Americans understand the disadvantages of an underclass status. By the very nature of its socioeconomic conditions, an underclass is predestined to live at the lowest level of the system of beggars or criminals. Neither civil rights nor social integration can effectively help them to escape from their underclass status. American ranking order of social acceptability is tightly woven into the nation's psyche. Some group has to be at the bottom. It is not possible for every group to be equal in social economic status. The question is, can blacks must can blacks muster the mental focus, resources, and determinations to break out and escape after so many years of being frozen at the bottom? If someone steals your car, you, you want your car back or something of equal value to replace it. Blacks must find a way to recapture what was lost or stolen from them and to use it to escape their constitutionally designated underclass status. Question three, how has Social integration failed black America. Social integration was po positioned to eradicate institutional racism and remedy the negative socioeconomic impact of centuries of slavery and Jim Crow segregation, but it failed. As a result, black Americans remain burdened by the economic, social, and pathological impacts that resulted from their historical maltreatment. In his book, The Tragic Failures of Integration, Liberal author Tom Wickard concludes that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream had turned into a black nightmare and that the success of the movement failed to translate into a full integration of full class citizenships for most blacks. Nearly 60 years after the black civil rights movement was hijacked by newly created and fabricated, fabricated minorities, a growing number of black Americans are reaching the same conclusion that they are still an outgroup in American society. They are learning the lessons that the Jewish people in Europe learned in the 1500s when they tried to integrate into mainstream society. Jews were a hated outgroup. The wagons that divide were a hated outgroup. They quickly learned that to protect their group, they quickly learned that to protect their group, it was better to circle the wagons than divide scatter into the larger populations, making them weaker and more vulnerable. It was better to circle the wagons than divide and scatter themselves into the larger populations, making them weaker and more vulnerable. This is a lesson yet to be learned by Black America. This is a lesson yet to be learned by Black America. After 50 years of marching and singing, 
we shall overcome someday. They are still fixed at the bottom of American society, buried beneath an unrelenting flow of immigrants and more economically dependent than they were in the 1960s when social integration began. The integration process made blacks unwanted guests in that what whites and their sub-ethnic groups owned and controlled. Blacks still own and control less than 1% of anything of value, but bear six to eight times of everything that is bad or negative. A few blacks have become visible as public officials, athletes, entertainers, and media personalities, but there is a little connection between their elevated public images and the low socioeconomic status of the black masses. Younger blacks are just beginning to gab the weight of the losses of black communities, schools, business, culture, history, leaders, sports teams, music, and exceptionally in a mainstream society. They have never had the positive experience of living in a black community. It is increasingly difficult for blacks to become a functional part of American society without physical communities or broad sense of community. The years between 1960 and 2014 could have produced a more sufficient black race if the civil rights movement had worked to address and correct the maldistribution of wealth. Income and resources that occurred because of 500 years of slavery and Jim Crow semi-slavery, while blacks were chasing the elusive social integration dream, the horrors inflicted on blacks receded from the consciousness of society and blacks lost their moral and political leverage. Blacks were displaced in the nation's consciousness by immigrants in general, and Hispanics in particular who particularly boast of their successful efforts to totally displace blacks in every aspect of American society. In his book, Presumed Alliance, the unspoken conflict between black and Latinos and what it means for America. The author, Nicholas C. Vaca, disdained a rainbow coalition and presumed alliance with black Americans. He said that Hispanics were no longer interested in being classified as white. They that they wanted to be viewed as a minority who could then compete with black for political and economic power, even though Hispanics from the Caribbean islands been enslaved or Jim Crowed, they felt that by their mere fact that they gained social economic benefits and become the nation's majority minority population. Their goal, according to Vaca, was displace blacks in every way possible. As an official outgroup, a primary target of conservative hate groups, there are neither rewards nor incentives for immigrant women, LGBT or poor whites to identify publicly with black Americas. This nation policy of political correctness all allows of these groups to rank higher than blacks in the nation order or social acceptability. The majority of immigrants are classified as white. They get double benefits when they are classified as an agreed minority and compete against blacks for public recognition and financial resources. Integration did not produce racial or economic equality for blacks because it was a sentiment. It was a doc doctrinal commitment by white society. The dream of Dr. King and there was a, of a colorblind society took the nation focused off blacks and gave the illusion of integration and equality. It destroyed the black unity that was forced on them by segregation. It destroyed the black unity that was forced on them by segregation. By the 1960s, convinced to believe in social integration, blacks gave up their communities, their business, the jobs those business created, their sport team, schools, professional and culture. By the 1970s, the immigrant groups poured into the community, created cohesive ethnic communities, often in the same physical location that blacks were be beginning to vacate. Integration was a failure for the native black Americans because they did not fully understand or appreciate the value of the communities they so eagerly abandoned. Integration was a failure for native black Americans because they did not fully understand or appreciate the value of the communities they so eagerly abandoned. Question four, what is the history of today's diversity policies? The word diversity was not selected at random. It has a purpose. The purpose of the policy of diversity was to divert resources, attention, opportunities, and population power away 
from black Americans. Today's diversity policies are simple. The old anti-black policies wearing a new set of clothes. The primary goal of the diversity policies after redirecting resources from blacks is to obligate the unique role blacks play in the development of these nations and to give a mythological impression that all groups contribute equally to the development of this nation. Nothing could be further from the truth. The diversity concept is designed to keep blacks powerless and impoverished, obscure, obscure the social construct that socioeconomically cripples blacks, and then give rights, resources, and protection earned by blacks to newly fabricated and cobbled together minority groups. The concept of diversity was first introduced into American society centuries ago in the slave codes of 1705. The diversity provision in the slave codes was a method to maintain a racial balance in number and to monitor blacks when they, are, when they aggregated. Diversity procedures regulated the number of blacks who could gather at one time and kept them under surveillance so that whites could be alert to and avert any effort which might ignite insurrections. To effectively manage large black populations in the South, the Diversity Act mandated that a slave must have at least one white person to control and monitor every four black slaves brought into the colonies. The slave to white ratio was difficult to keep in the mid-1700s because England, the chief slave trading nation, wanted to have as many slaves as possible in the colonies in order to produce as much commercial product for England as possible. To prevent or reduce the possibility of blacks and native Indians forming a coalition to drive whites back to the Europe, when the black slave population reached nearly 40% in 1750, white colonial planters requested the British government do two things. One, reduce the number of slaves being shipped into the southern colonies. Two, send more Europeans to be in the management class in the south, but in the north to do the reverse to import four whites to every black so nation's majority population will remain white. Colonists in the South wanted to prevent slaves from escaping to nearby Florida, which was the Spanish territory and where the slaves would be free Spanish citizens upon arrival. The colonists therefore established a new colony, Georgia, as a buffer between South Carolina and the Spanish territory of Florida. A primary purpose of the Georgia buffer zone was to impede black slave runaways from escaping South Carolina plantation and migrating to slave sanctuaries in Spanish Florida. To secure uh, the buffer colony and to maintain the required ratios of blacks to whites, more white bodies were needed. To meet that demand, colonial powers convinced the British government to empty its prisons, poor houses, and insane asylums and ship large numbers of white immigrants to settle in the newly established colony of Georgia. Meanwhile, the Spanish government and the Catholic Church continued to encourage slaves to come to Florida. Hundreds of slaves successfully escaped into Spanish Florida where they were granted land and become settlers and free citizens. The Catholic Church and the official Church of Spain and the power source behind the Spanish, the Spanish crown typically assisted the slaves to escape and establish themselves in the new country. The 1705 Diversity Act included a provision that required white males to be members of a local militia to bear arms and to perform slave monitoring duties. All communities had to have plantation police or paddy rollers to monitor the monitor movements of slaves and to patrol for runaway slaves. The diversity provision that required whites to be dominant population and possesses arms to control and monitor slaves was the foundation for the Second Amendment to the U U.S. Constitution and a tool to establish and maintain a country for a free white population that controlled everything. White population domination was the, the status national goal, but the, re the reality was quite different. The, the North had limited use for slaves. In the South, plantation owners needed black slaves for labor and blacks were the dominant population in many colonies. When the diversity policy was first initiated in 1705, the slave population was nearly 40% nationally, and over 50% in the South, states was continued to grow. 
The North saw expansion of the black population as a threat. Southern plantation owners could not achieve a white majority population because cheap white labor could not compete with free black labor and white immigrants did not want to migrate into the South from Southern culture. As a practical matter, the plantation owners accept large black populations, but devised cruel and physical and psychological measures that were so horrific and brutal that the slaves endure intense fear, pain, anxiety, and continuous terror. They were not permitted to be human. Some died from their experiences, but most gave into the conditioning and did not revolt. The slave owners took these measures to protect themselves, to control the, ma the majority. By the time of the Civil War began in 1861, states like South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and Georgia had the black populations that were approaching the 50% mark. The Diversity Act that required white men to carry weapons and to monitor slaves led to the Second Amendment that was included as a requirement in the U.S. Constitution. Today, 160 years after the American Civil War ended, the diversity concept in race matters has regained, again, reared its head. Just like in previous centuries, present-day diversity policy devalues blacks and equates every, every newly fabricated minority to the historical struggles of blacks. In 1978, the U.S. Supreme Court decisions in favor of Allen back accelerated the shift from black to, to diversity. Bach was a white medical student who claimed that preference given to blacks were underlying cause of his rejection from medical school and, th and that those preferences amounted to discrimination against him. A minority opinion stated that there was no constitutional justification for a preferential treatment for any group other than black Americans but the majority sided with Bach. Public and private policymakers responded. They adopted the language of civil rights, but applied it to diversity, which only nominally include blacks, and in reality benefited groups more acceptable to the public. Groups that did not conjure up uncomfortable images of slavery, segregation, or black power. White policymakers knew that shift away from corrective preferential treatment for blacks to generalized diversity would be detrimental to blacks. The policy shift to unearned entitlement to grouping of diversity, diverse people was made behind closed doors, deemed politically correct, then announced to the public. Liberals felt that growing opposition from whites would impede any corrective action for blacks, so liberals switched gears and eagerly embraced diversity for any certified new minorities as the new national civil rights goal. Black civil rights leaders who since they were politically powerless and had gone as far as they could go, followed liberals by embracing diversity and political correctness that made blacks invisible, having knowingly sold out their people. The civil rights established kept silent and promoted the new fabricated minority classes with the hope that some blacks might inadvertently benefit through diversity inclusion programs and political correctness attitudes. Which were, popular, which were popular in mainstream society. Both government and private sector accepted the illegal diversity rationale with the clear understanding that, that blacks would be nearly excluded from preferential treatment and public resources diverted to the newly fabri fabricated minorities. The federal government failed to, failure to enforce the nation's immigration laws enabled a massive influx of legal and illegal Hispanics immigrations to enter the United States. They soon surpassed the native black population and became the majority minority and the nation's preferred minority in terms of receiving benefits and privileges. By the year 2000, such large numbers of Hispanics have entered the country that they displaced blacks in the population and from the nation's conscious, consciousness. Blacks moved down from the second class to the third class citizens. The reduction of blacks to the third class citizens gave Hispanics greater political leverage than blacks in voting potential, business development, and public consciousness. The preferential immigration policies that sparked the growth of Hispanics were in response to the gains blacks made during the civil rights era. By 2014, there were 55 million blacks in the U.S., making up more than 17% of the population. 93% of Hispanics have, have been in the country less than 40 years. 
Since the year 2000, Hispanic organizations, author and media personalities, public boast that they have been made black, obsolete, replaced them as a majority minority and made them instead the minority minority. Adhering to a trickle down belief, Hispanics argue that blacks have had their day. The diversity concept as a public policy is offered a menu of preferred gender or ethnic groups from which the white overclass can choose to direct resources and opportunities. Diversity is a broad and ambiguous concept. Diversity is a broad and ambiguous concept, which hides from the public, which hides from public view who actually receive the targeted benefits. Traditional politician and policymakers embrace diversity and put a screening halt to the efforts that were just beginning to put to be put in place to correct some of the government actions that had excluded blacks from the economics of the U.S. for 360 years. Diversity policies became a facade for covering up the abuse inflicted on blacks by the U.S. government. Each class group that receives gratuitous special treatment further dilutes and redirects resources away from blacks. It is continuous assault. For an example of the group of the way groups are gratuitous added to diversity without connection to American history is the proposal by Brett, uh, President Barack Obama in October 2016, his final year in office, to add Middle Eastern people as a new racial category for the census and public policy. This will be the biggest realignment of federal definition of race in decades and would further lock Native blacks into the lowest level of the nation's rank order of social acceptance. Amazingly, 50 years after the massive influx of immigrants began to displace Native Black Americans, Black elected officials and civil rights leaders remain committed to open door immigrations and diversity, even though these policies are injurious to members of their own race. Liberals, liberals argue altruistically that diversity and recognition of gender language and ethnic groups is good for the nation. Liberals find pra practically no resistance when, they're, when they abandon black Americans whose suffering was out of vogue and eagerly jumped on the bandwagon of diversity. After decades of refocusing the nation's attention away from blacks to preferential treatment and affirmative action for diversity, the nations can easily point to the accomplishment achieved by women, Hispanics, Asians, LGBT, Arabs, and the handicaps in the corporate boardrooms, contract office, college classrooms, and government jobs. The gains of blacks in those categories, however, are minuscule. They are at the bottom, and over the past 50 years, those gains have mostly evaporated. Black people replaced by diversity remain excluded, abandoned, and quiet. President Donald Trump was unique among presidential candidates in that he acknowledged the needs of black people specifically and promised to address them. But blacks have not yet made an effort to hold him to those promises. Question five, did, I, did Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King colorblind dream take the focus off black rights? Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's principle of colorblind diverted blacks from prioritizing their own group self-interest and guided them backwards to being altruistic, thinking first of others. His shift from black to colorblindness reversed the long fight of black leaders to draw a singular focus to their own group. In that respect, Dr. King altruism took, pla took blacks back to their way they had to think when they were slaves. When the Civil War and slavery ended, in the 1860s, black ex-slaves had an opportunity for something they had long prayed for, a chance to place their own group self-interest first. For centuries, they were denied the right to have a personal or black group self-interest. The sole focus of a slave's life was to care for the master. His interest in view of the world through his master's eyes only. During slavery, some blacks did fight for black rights. The strength of their advocacy varied from the extremely aggressive efforts of Nat Turner, Gabrielle Proser, Denmark Vesey, to medical advocates like Frederick Dulux, Harriet Tubman, Booker T. Washington. After slavery ended, black activists hop, hoped they would be, direct, be able to direct their energies and resources to benefit their own people. However, 
that was not to be. The Civil, the Civil War ended in 1865. Reconstruction lasted about 10 years, ended about 1875. As that period ended, the dominant white society issued laws and public policies that socioeconomically brittled black group self-interest. They were limited. They were limited in kinds of business and schools they could operate. Black candidates for public office were instructed to speak in gener generalities. They could not speak out in the interest of blacks or hold whites accountable for the past injustice. Around 1915, a pro-blackness period finally did emerge and lasted for a full generation. W.E.B. Du Bois began advocating black-based politics. Marcus Garvey advocated black economics. Horta G. Wilson's emphasized black education. Elijah Mohana organized the black Muslims and black entertainers and artists pushed blackness through the Harlem Renaissance. The increased focus on blackness resulted in the rise of black leaders who in 1928 petitioned the federal government to codify blacks' self-interest by passing the Negro Bill of Rights. Their intent was to organize and focus public attention to revive the historical legacies that kept blacks fixed at the lowest rung of social society hierarchy. In the late 1950s, Reverend Mar Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a 28-year-old black preacher, burst into the nation's conscience and became the leader of the civil rights movement, which was fo focused singularly on black issues at the time. As time went on, however, the, moment, the movement lost focus. Dr. King was the first black leader to convert black problems into a broad category and minority issues, which include gender, ethnicity, language, religion, handicap status, and poverty classes. The Th Thomas E. Woods Jr. in his book, 33 Questions About American History, pointed out and discussed how Dr. King proposed that the nation's institute a bill of rights for a disadvantage, not a bill of rights for black Americans. The dream disadvantage became synonymous with minority and equated government instituted slavery to contemporary issues such as poverty, gender, and immigration. Instead of framing the focus of his work to long-suffering Black Americans, Dr. King's enthusiasm of disadvantages opened the door to a myriad and ambiguous groups that made the, the, the case that they too had suffered institutional maltreatment, deprivation, and exploitation. Dr. King's actions started Black America down the slippery slope of competition with fabricated minority issues in 1960 when he said, we're going to take this movement and reach out to the poor in all directions in this country, into the Southeast after the Native, Native Indians, into the West after the Chichinos, into the Appalachia for poor whites, and into the ghettos for the Negroes and the Puerto Ricans. And we're going to bring them together and enlarge this campaign into something bigger than just the civil rights movement for Negroes. When Dr. King folded poverty, class, gender, ethnicity, and language groupers into black civil rights movement, he effectively destroyed the movement for blacks. It took away the issues of their exceptionality in society, issues which has never been fully addressed nor remedied. The a unique historical experience of black Americans became synonymous with minorities, multiculturalism, diversity, people of color, and poor people. These, of course, issues confuse racial issues with class issues. These, of course, issues confuse racial issues with class issues. Dr. King's re redirection of the nation's attentions to poor people and other oppressed people of the world, but put black Americans on the back seat of the bus and voluntarily reversed the course of black self-interest to the days when they were denied the right to even have a group self-interest. He and the movement became broadly focused on everyone, all people and everything except black rights. Dr. King's actions absolved rights of any need to fulfill the requirement of the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution to lift the burdens and incendices of slavery from the shoulders of black people. The nation's attention continued, continues to shift more comfortably toward the class and gender groups leaving the legacies of slavery and Jim Crow segregation proportionally unchanged between whites and blacks. The concept of color blindness did in, indeed take the focus off black rights. Whether that it is a positive or a negative depends upon the person on which you sit. <laughs>
Question six. Are blacks more vulnerable to terrorism than other Americans? Black Americans are most definitely more vulnerable to terrorism than other Americans. Terrorism is rooted in human psychological pathology that seeks to intimidate, injure, or control other humans based upon religious, political, and racist ideology of the terrorists. Five centuries of institutionalized enslavement, Jim Crow segregation, and being non neglect have made black Americans a favorite target of conservative terrorists, hate mongers, and religious zealots. Blacks are the most indefiable and vulnerable population group in America because they are totally dependent upon non-black racial and ethnic groups for their safety and daily needs. Just as they are unprepared to protect themselves in the case of civil arrest or natural disasters, it would be even more difficult for black Americans to protect themselves from institutional-based, culture-driven terrorism because they live in a cultural less porous, dysfunctional neighborhoods instead of close-knit, functionally black communities. Blacks laugh a defense code of conduct. Blacks lack a defensive code of conduct. The definition of a functional community is a physical community that has a culture and code that supports an alternate and semi-independent econ economy that produces service, goods, jobs, and has a tax base for its residents. In a functional community, people are familiar with each other and have a common needs and interests. It is where they store and secure their wealth, power, business, heritage, jobs, products, and other resources. A functional community has an identity and operation network of obligations between its members and socioeconomic enterprises. To successfully protect its member, a community must have a physical location and infrastructure that can be marked and closed, if necessarily against outsiders who might pose dangers. Members who live outside the physical community can still identify with it by having a broad sense of community and sharing the community history, needs, interests, and goals, and the responsibility to protect and support the physical community and its members. The bane of vulnerability of Blacks to modern terrorism result from their not having functional communities. Blacks were complacent in white society's destruction of Black communities that did exist until 1960s. Now Blacks have surrendered their community resources, sense of community, collective ability to protect themselves from outside competitive and hostile groups that can and have historically terrorized them. In most cases, in most instances, Black neighborhoods lack organizational institutions, local communication station, surplus food, water, energy, and medical systems. The integration process is diluted or removed experience Black leadership from Black neighborhoods, leaving those left behind unprepared to deal with terrorists or other life-threatening crises. Just like the KKK symbols and marches, the primary goal of terrorism is to create fear and confusion horrendous enough to disrupt the social economic system, paralyze citizens, and inhibit the flow of needed daily resources. Terrorism are unlike a class standing army. They do not wear uniforms or bear standardized flags. They are advantaged by being unknown and invisible. They pledge their total allegiance and lives and lives to a political ideology or religion. And most importantly, they do not actually exist until after they have committed a terrorist act. If they are successful in committing an act of terror, the media becomes complacent for promoting the successful act, which publicizes the causes of terrorists and demonstrates their ability to achieve their objectives. They are not interested in how they are labeled and what consequences befall them. Terrorism between best and open societies, where people have many freedoms and their movements and activities are not under suspicion. Terrorists thrive on publicity and seek the minority of public identification. Although episodes of terrorism are newsworthy events, extensive media coverage set the stage for even more terrorist acts of violence. Again, just like Blacks have been impotent against the Ku Klux Klan and other forms of white terrorism, the United States of America itself is totally ill-prepared to fight, let alone win a holy war against terrorist raised virtual war. Our government leaders promote the, be the behalf, promote the belief that America is the world's superpower
a world police force that has politically obligated itself to be moral conscious of the world or response to terrorism as a nation and aim and logical ignores what is known about the true nature in inter international terrorism black america is even more defenseless and invulnerable than the larger society that has organized institution and resources there is no interest nor any incentives for other ethnic or class groups to take care of the needs of black people there is also no invisible evidence that blacks have made preparations to protect themselves the electrical blackout of 2003, which impacted the entire Northeast region of the, of the U.S., sent messages to blacks that other groups felt no obligations to share their resources with, with blacks during a major crisis. In the Detroit area, for example, many whites and ethnic suburban communities did not permit blacks from the city to enter from for food, gas, or other essentials. In the Detroit area, for example, many white and ethnic suburban communities did not permit blacks from the city to enter for food, gas, or other essentials. Blacks must have their own backup resources, whether in a dependent black neighborhood or socially scattered guest in white communities. They must have a protection in daily necessity of life and emergencies. When terrorism or man-made and natural disasters strike, it will be very difficult, if not too late, for blacks to gain access to vital resources, such as doctors, hospitals, and grocery stores. Black elected officials, civil rights organizations, Churches and, un 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 and educational centers should take major responsibility to alert, organize, and prepare black communities to deal with terrorism in any form because black America or a vulnerable out group. Where are, question seven, where are the black leaders? The term black leader is an oxymoron. Based upon the definition of leader, one has little choice but to conclude that blacks do not have leaders. A leader is a guiding or directing head of a group. One who leads towards a new direction after critical analysis of the social, economic, and political condition of the group. The leader would then develop a plan with strategies to take them to a better place. Moses, in the Bible, was such a leader. Clearly, the civil rights movement of the 1960s began with the intent to lead blacks the new, in a new direction, but the movement had no national plan, no destination or group center. Measurable goals. The main issues were desegregation, voting rights, decriminalization, and did not target equal distribution of resources, a measure goal that had the potential change to a social construct on race for a group. Because the goals did not challenge the foundation problems of black. And the movement became dependent upon the government corporate support, it was easily controlled, marginalized, and consumed into policies of being non-neglect and political correctness. Once in go, black leaders were easily controlled and marginalized on the black matters. They became invisible. Black leadership today has become symbolic and ceremonial. Old civil rights personalities, entertainers, and black officials have no objective basis or proposable destinations to lead blacks to or away from the conditions in which blacks have already emerged. In most instances, those blacks who want to be leaders have not studied or examined the economic or political conditions of black dilemma, nor have they crafted a crap corrective plan to improve the quality of life for the group. Their words lack academic discipline and solutions they propose are most often without direction or purpose. In other words, most visible blacks do not equate to black leaders. They are double agents who intentionally represent everyone. They are double agents who intentionally represent everyone. All races, ethnicity, cultures, religion, genders, and classes. They skillfully identify black issues, but propose minority solutions to, to address them. They, skill, they, they skillfully identify black issues, but propose minority solutions to address them. They do not even pur purport to represent black interests. However, why is the media and those seeking to influence blacks accept their symbolic leadership? Most visible blacks are welded to playing party politics, towing the line as political correct individuals identifying with mainstream issues. They demonstrate more self-interest 
than group interests and deliver no tangible nor measurable benefits, especially to their own race. Whether they pretend to be colorblind or simply do not recognize the suffering of their own people, they seem to relish engagement in symbolic activities that are meaningless. Symbolic leaders ignore exceptionalism of blacks and proclaim inaccurately that all groups have contributed equally to the development of this nation. When they accepted it, the myth that blacks were not treated any differently than any other group or population, it became easy to neutralize and, and obscure the blacks and their historical exceptionality. As, as the loose purpose of the civil rights movement expanded and became more diffused, black leaders would be leaders find more comfort and in safety in advocating for realization of a dream of a colorblind society than fight for a more sufficient and competitive black America. They are now so colorblind, they cannot even see their own black color. As a result, black America increasingly views symbolic leadership as irrelevant and harmful to the black struggle for survival. The years between 1870s and 2017 have been transition period for black leadership. It has gone from particularly no leadership during slavery to symbolic leadership in what is incorrectly labeled by some a post-racist society. In the early 1800s, black ministers provided monitored leadership for free and non-free -black, blacks. These leaders were appointed by the white power structure, which also instructed the ministers in what they could not and could not say. After the Civil War, a few elected officials, community activists, and businessmen joined ministers in the leadership ranks and began shaping a black overclass. In the 1960s, black leaders were community activists, ministers, and civil rights organizers who collectively pushed Congress to enact new voting rights. Those laws resulted in a large number of black elected officials who became the new overclass and began the shift to symbolic leadership from the previous black focused community activists, ministers of the civil rights organization. What happened to black leaderships in a social political context is so critically important that it demands further elaboration, even at the risk of being repetitious. Re 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 in 1970s, government made aggressive efforts to shift focused blacks to fabricate Classes. Civil rights activists acquired the, the new social uh, movements filled the vacuum sparked by the simultaneous social impact of the massive inflow of immigrants from developing nations and growing momentum of the women's liberation movement. The public policy of, of political correctness also took hold, cemented the refocus of official attention from blacks to women, the newly created minority groups. President Richard Nixon public policy of being non neglect was successful and caused the public and private sectors to lessen their to lessen their interest in blacks and to shift to women minorities and immigration groups. Black leaders and their respective organization were successfully persuaded to abandon their own people and to take up the cause of broad ambiguous groupings under the facades of diversity, multicultural minorities of people of color. Never before has any religion, gender, ethnic, or language groups have been required to shift their attention away from their own people. Once black leadership was marginalized and incorporated into the system of political correctness, there was little that they could do to address the needs of black Americans. Apparently, they did not suspect that once inside they would be become irrelevant. Since they were politically separated from their own people, they had no means to pressure the power structure. No other group, European whites, Jews, Asians, Arabs, or American Indians was expected to, di to, di to divorce itself intentionally from its culture and primary group. In politics, the detachment of the black elected official gives them the lane to promise nothing and deliver nothing to the black electorate, which continually votes for them as a bloc. Electing blacks to public office therefore has made no major difference in the equality of life for black Americans or the status quo in racial disparities. The blacks elected electorate receives no direct relationship, tangible or measurable benefits from electing black persons to a, a public office. In the 30 year time period between 1960 and 1990, 
the number of black elected officials increased from 103 to 9,000, which continue, constitutes a 9,000% increase in the total number of black elected officials across America. Yet when comparing the social discomfort indicators in 1960 with the black indicators in 1990, after a 9,000% increase in the number of black elected officials, the, con the conditions of black Americans did not improve, but worsened. Those parallels are apparent today in 2017, which suggests that there is no direct connection between blacks elected or political candidate into public offices or receiving tangible benefits for their vote, such as increased employment, business ownership, improved housing, functional schools, safe streets, medical service, wealth, income, social acceptance, or political power. These observations seem to hold true when even they even when assessing the, the legacies of black Barack Obama, known as the nation's first African American president. At the end of his presidency, black people were in the same state they were in before he was elected to the highest office in the land. In, in summary, the whites overclass response to social to, to civil rights is slowed. And most often symbolic, they rejected nearly everything that requires the sustain of change in the racial status quo. The old line civil rights organization have failed to address the historical legacies and dilemmas of black America. Most blacks recognized by the general public as leaders are simply tools that the whites overclass uses to keep the black masses placated and black neighborhoods under control. black neighborhoods under control. Keep the black neighborhoods under control. Overclass used to keep the blacks placated in the black neighborhoods under control, non-competitive and powerless. Symbolic black leadership has become largely irrelevant in the struggle for blacks survival and socioeconomic competitiveness. They will continue to routinely appear in the print and electronic media to support or discuss non-black issues. They will boast about racial progress and minority political alliances to justify their appeal to white society for financial support. Sadly, at the same time, the black masses will sink further into a permanent underclass status. Question eight. Can blacks be a competitive group without a group self-interest? It will be very difficult for black Americans to become a competitive group if they cannot shake the unique social conditioning imposed on them during five centuries of slavery, Jim Crow, semi-slavery. Normally a group that has been systematically oppressed for a prolonged period develops a heightened sense of group consciousness, self-interest, and close its ranks against outside threat. Blacks appear to be different. The 21st generation of uh, wealth, the, the first generation of black America remain bound for, by lessons learned in slavery that stripped them of their group self-interest. They remain altruistic, dedicated to the welfare of others before themselves. They love everybody, are forgiving, long-suffering, hard-working, self-sacrificing, dedicated to taking care of others first and to look for a reward in heaven after death. Today, that mindset has resulted in blacks who believe that because of their long status as sufferers, they ought to be the moral conscience of the nation of the world. Few black ministers tell their congregations that it is actually against the Bible instructions to sacrifice themselves, abandon their homes, families, and race to save others, regardless as to whether they are immigrants ethnics, homeless and impoverished, gay or any fabricated minority, blacks carry the moral and civil rights banner for all people, while most people look out for themselves and ignore the needs of black masses. In a race-based society, every group is competing to win in their own group self-interest. As a group by not having self-interest and being altruistic, black lose by default. They are poor and powerless. Their labor and culture have enriched nearly every group on earth except their own. With a sense of self-interest, a group can recognize competitive advantages, opportunities, and ways to protect and build on what it has that is vulnerable. 
Success will come only when they can unify and compete in the best interest of the group. Question nine. What is the difference between a black American and an African, African American? The term black American and African American are not equivalently or interchangeable. Although they are generally erroneously considered as such by whites and some native blacks. Black Americans are born in America and are descendants of slaves. Africa American is a term most accurately applied to a person born in Africa that has relocated or migrated to America. In reality, each term is derived from totally different cultures, language, political, religions, and racial experiences. Any group in a sum total of unique experiences will dictate the way group members see themselves in this world. 99% of all black people in America are descendants of slaves who were born in America. Their, their only connections to Africa are the oral stories told to them by their parents and grandparents, which faded with each generation. They have no personal connections to Africa. Not one country of the African continent ever sent a single vessel to this country to rescue any of the millions of blacks who were kidnapped enslaved, killed, and psychologically crippled. Enslaved blacks in America were decultured and forced to devise their own survival skills and attitudes. These enslaved persons and their offsprings were striped of everything and forced to adapt and survive under the most inhumane conditions for over 360 years. During a, that period of time, they developed a blended culture emerged as black Americans no longer African. Black Americans are totally unlike any other human on this earth. They are a combination of culture and uncommon experiences. Therefore, the group is special and exceptional. Some avoid the term black because they do not want to identify with the negative and evil historically associated with the world by whites and other groups. Some blacks shun self-identification by color because it means being less than a fool. Stripped of all honor and subject to all forms of white rule and power. They have allowed others to frame their thinking of the label or of the world black. Those who avoid blackness in effort have surrendered their greatest strength and badge to, of identity. Black Americans are unique. The enslaved process stripped blacks of their Africanness and forced them to forge together their own unique culture. It is so unique that it, it is copied, mimicked, and appropriated by non-blacks all over the world. Many blacks and non-blacks and especially conservatives prefer the term African-American. It is a term that removes race from a race-based dilemma and redirects focus to culture. African-American is a less specific term than blacks. Just a substituting term like minority, people of color, poor people is less threatened than the term black. The term African-American obfuscates, dilutes, and erases the unique history of blacks in this country. Blacks should never be equated to African-Americans or other groups within the minority class. Using the term African-American is an example of changing black problems to a minority problem. Since all life began in Africa, in the broadest sense, the label African-American can be applied to any human from any place on the earth that migrates to America. Once they establish residency in America, they can legitimately claim to be African-American. Blacks exceptionality is fundamental key to unlock the doors of leading to group self-empowerment, recognitions, respect, and appreciations for their contributions of the, to the socioeconomic development of these nations to which they are entitled as special people. They must distinguish themselves by claiming their exceptionality as black Americans, just as the Europeans in the 1680s distinguished themselves by officially labeling themselves white Americans instead of pilgrims and Puritans. The label white distinguished them thereafter. Due to the fact that the masses of the black in Americans are totally ignorant of Africa, they identify with African Americans. Label only out of love and respect for the black people residing on the African continent in physical and genetic make makeup, they are as far from being Africa blacks as they are from being European whites. There are enormous differences in the experience of a black person born and raised in America versus an African born and raised on African continent. Native blacks in America were stripped of their Africanness centuries ago when their ancestors were transported to the Americas. It was at that point that their differences began. Black folks 
Blacks were forced to create and fabricate a culture that blended the various African tribal backgrounds with the American culture they founded here. Being enslaved in America was a very different experience than being colonized on the African continent. African Blacks was not stripped of their culture, language, families, with relatives, homeland, communities, religion, sense of peoplehood. Where on the other hand, Black Americans were stripped in all respects, reduced to the level of field animals and treated as disposable property. Consequently, African Blacks who visited or migrated to the United States, since they are different from Native Blacks, and tend to express a degree of super superiority over the descendants of slaves. They are different. They came here voluntarily, have homelands and relatives in Africa with whom they identify and communicate, and they have a place to return whenever so they so choose. Americans recognize the difference also in accord greater to, uh, respect to African visitors, dignitaries than to Native Blacks. In fact, it was not unusual prior to the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s for uh, Black Americans to dress in African garb and pretend to be African visitors or dignitaries just to gather greater respect from white Americans. Using unspecific terms like African American obscures the unique history of Blacks in America, and they have harmful effects similar to what happens when the term minority people of color or poor people are used instead of Blacks. A lawsuit filed against the Pakistani who applied for the African American Banneker Scholarship at the U University of Maryland in the 1990s demonstrate the folly of the imprecise language. The university denied him a scholarship because recipients had to be African American. The Pakistani student filed a lawsuit charging the university with discrimination. The student case was based on a very simple but reasonable explanation. The Pakistani student said he lived in Africa before migrating to the United States and considered himself African. Now that he lives in America, he is an African American. And the, the, the Maryland Supreme Court agreed and ruled the student's favor, awarding him 150000 The message to Native Blacks is a caution. In circumstances where a race label is necessary, do not permit the, work, the use of broad and ambiguous terms to define you. The school did, did not meet its goal of providing scholarship for a specific purpose of attracting Black students. The school needs were specific, but the term African American was not. It expanded the target group in an imprecise imp 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 way. Had the school used the term black, the Benneker Scholarship found would have had an additional 150,000 to distribute toward worthy black applicants. The distinction between black and African American is important. Blacks came here as Africans, but what they experienced in this current country made them different. They were stripped of everything, their culture, language, religion, the right to benefit from their own labor. They were not acknowledged as humans and were denied the, ex the expression of natural human longings. They could not love, protect, or plan for their families. Blacks endured these experiences, all, all the while their labor drove the economic engine that built this nation. Withstanding and surviving these experiences became the badge of courage that distinguishes Native Blacks from any other group in America. Those experiences signify this in the historical experience, but two groups are genetically linked. It is imperative, therefore, that Native Black Americans support and recognize Africa, the birthplace of mankind, and strive to protect its people and material resources from further abuse and exploitation by foreign entities. Question 10. What is racism? And can a Black person be racist? Racism is a group-based power and economic control phenomenon in which one racial group owns and controls so much wealth and resource power that it can enslave, subordinate, exploit, exclude, or render another group non-competitive. The dominant racial group can make life and death decisions for potential competitor groups. It can predetermine what the lesser group, the lesser power group can own, control its wealth and the extent to which it will be allowed to compete. Racism is one of the most contentious and dangerous terms in the English lexicon and is overused and misapplied by laymen and scholars alike.
In a society in which political and in which policies of being not neglect is still operative against blacks, there has been an effort to equate and replace racism with classism. Class is defined by economic status, educational level and employment status, and professional accomplishment. Class is fluid. Racism against blacks is fixed. Classism and racism are not the same. Blacks as a group cannot cross the color of or, or race line. Religious, gender, ethnic, and or cultural groups are not the victims of racism, but of classism. The power of economic control phenom of racism is non-applicable to them which to, to, to them which be, to them which of them are applicable because classes are subcategories of the larger society and generally they are participated in economic enrich from black enslavement. Further, classes are open and fluid and promote the right to compete for equality. Racism came into existence on the eve of the Civil War after all the resources had been distributed to European whites. The practice of racism was originally designed to deny blacks the right to compete, to be equal, or to become a class. While racism is a group-based, class disc discrimination is in individualized and arises from prevailing so 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 societally issues. For instance, when Arabs were are profiled and connected to terrorism, it is discrimination, but it's not racism. When, 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 his, when Hispanics are profiled and associated with illegal immigration, it is not racism, but discrimination ar arises out of contemporary social concern. In neither of the recited instances, it is the purpose of the class discrimination to exploit, enslave, or segregate all members of the class. It is inaccurate to, to equate class minorities to blacks in racism. History reveals that the concept of racism has undergone a metamorphosis in both meaning and applications through the centuries. To understand racism and deal with it effectively, it is important to understand the historical origins and purpose of racism. To know what it is and what it is not, racism as a word and concept did not just pop up out of the blue. It evolved from a confluence of events and circumstances. The practices of equating individualized gender, ethnic, cultural, religious, and discrimination institutional racism against black people provides justification for continuing the racist status quo. In the late 1400s, two essential factors came together from which racism evolved, the possibilities for free land in the Americas of free labor from American blacks. At that time, the entire continent of Europe was dysfunctional, ravaged by famine, crime, poverty, and disease. European countries were looking for lands to conquer to infuse their nations with new energies and wealth. The Catholic Church was the leading invader and controller of the world's expansionism. During that period, the Vatican was given 16 black slaves as a gift. A short time later, Pope Innocent issued a special edict and declared that blacks should be used as free labor, thereby establishing a new kind of slavery. Until that time, a person could be enslaved for only three reasons, religion, persecution, personal indebtedness, or for being a prisoner of war. When Columbus returned to Europe with news that have, been, have had discovered a new uninhabited land, a vision to took hold, to emerge available free black labor with the new free land. At that precise point, racism replaced tribalism the social structure of Europe at that time. Nine European nations went into a competition. A political economic race commenced to see which country could be, could best exploit free labor and use of its captured land, resource, wealth to enrich their countries. The economic race using free black labor lasted until the eve of 1861. Civil War in the U.S. The race began, the European nations ended at this point because the resources and wealth of America have been distributed and nearly 100% of everything was now in the hands of white Europeans. At that same time, European slaveholders denied enslaved blacks the rights not only to enjoy the future of their labor, but also the right to acquire land, wealth, and political power. These exclusions were instituted as law and blacks were defined as powerless power, property. The founding fathers rigged the race. They crafted a social construct that locked blacks into a constitutional underclass status 
and white society as a group remains of opposed to corrective redistribution of wealth, power, or resources to black Americans. After all resource had been distributed to whites by the 1860s, the concept of racism morphed into an economic issues to one of biology with Charles Darwin theory of natural selection precedent in, in his book in 1859, Origins of, of the Species. In this book, he ranked living organisms and classified blacks at the bottom of human species. Out of Darwin's biological theories grew the requirement that all persons be identified by racial designation on birth certificates, certificates driver license, and other public documents. Race remained a biological issue until the century later with the advert of the, civil, of the black civil rights movement when racism morphed again. The concept of racism expanded and took on a more colloquial and casual meaning that signified not power, but personal feelings about disliking or disliking the individual. This misdirection and the misapplication of the term racism allowed the original objective of racism to maintain the inequality between whites and blacks to continue uninhabited. Racism grew out the competitive race between groups to control wealth and power. As early as 1516 in North America, whites have been the winners and blacks the losers, allowed only to react to racism, to white racism. Blacks did not have power or wealth. It is therefore not possible for them to be racist.